Yeah, only you, me, and that Jeff guy that was here last week. He never looks at it, so don't worry. He doesn't care. So. Pass radio. Just kidding. Are you sure she took that test? No more multiple choice. So we are going to. Let's see. Let me turn this on so everybody at home can see. If you guys want to log into the GoToMeeting thing, you can. You don't have to necessarily, but so you're gonna put it on the TV. I'm going to put it on the TV. Uh, do you mind if I have a restroom? Yeah, yeah. You need to take a break or you need another cookie with peanut butter on it. The peanut butter. Feel free. Uh, turn on. Oh, that's nice. It's like, let me log in and it takes it off and makes me log in again. Oh, that's awesome. Stupid. Boom, there it goes. So today, um, still in with the whole weather thing. Waiting for this thing to pop up here. Um, so today, well, first of all, I wanted to still. There's there's a video that I had in here. I should have given it to you guys yesterday. But um, I don't know why I thought it was on there, but I guess it wasn't. Anyway, it, it still is going to recap a little bit of the stuff that you saw yesterday because I know yesterday was kind of big and it had a lot of stuff. So there's this video that um, mm -hmm. recaps a little bit of that stuff and then also kind of starts going into today's stuff. But today's stuff is mostly weather charts. So we're going to look at – all of these different charts that you see on here, surface analysis, weather depiction, and so on. Um, but the, the video here will go over quite a bit of it as well. So, But then we'll talk about it, and we'll kind of put in our little two cents how it relates into dispatch. So let me start this here. That's another thing I forgot. Uh, for you guys online, I'm going to send you guys the link because I know that these don't play very good just watching them on here. So. Your benefits links on the top that are Correct. Yeah. Um, if anybody wants to. If anybody needs a Delta friend or a United enrolled friend, I'm your I'm your person. Okay, and I will I will pay you top dollar for it. Yes. Do you have people on this? Oh, you do? No. Taylor is on my desk. But I want to Okay, those of you on the line, I just put a, posted a link on there. Just click on that link and start watching this video. 
Yeah, yeah, we're not going to watch every ounce of it, but yeah. Tutorial 12, Aviation Weather Services. This lesson will cover aviation weather services. Through a complex system of weather services, government agencies, and independent weather observers, pilots and other aviation professionals receive the benefit of this vast knowledge base in the form of up-to-date weather reports and forecasts. These reports and forecasts enable pilots to make informed decisions regarding weather and flight safety before and during a flight. There are four types of weather observations surface, upper air, radar, and satellite. Surface aviation weather observations, METARs, are a compilation of elements of the current weather at individual ground stations across the United States that provide continuous, up-to-date weather information. Automated weather sources, such as the Automated Weather Observing Systems, AWOS, Automated Surface Observing Systems, ASOS, Air Route Traffic Control Center, ARTCC facilities, as well as other automated facilities, also play a major role in the gathering of surface observations. Surface observations provide local weather conditions and other relevant information for a radius of five miles of a specific airport. This information includes the type of report, station identifier, date and time, modifier as required, wind, visibility, runway visual range, RVR, weather phenomena, sky condition, temperature dew point, altimeter reading, and applicable remarks. Although the reports cover only a small radius, the pilot can generate a good picture of the weather over a wide area when many reporting stations are looked at together. The ARTCC facilities are responsible for maintaining separation between flights conducted under instrument flight rules, IFR, in the en route structure. Center radars, air route surveillance radar, ARSR, acquire and track transponder returns using the same basic technology as terminal radars. Controllers can select the level of weather to be displayed. Observations of upper air weather are more challenging than surface observations. There are only two methods by which upper air weather phenomena can be observed. Radio sonde observations and pilot weather reports, PIREX. A radio sonde is a small cubic instrumentation package which is suspended below a six foot hydrogen or helium filled balloon. As it ascends, the instrumentation gathers various pieces of data, such as air temperature and pressure, as well as wind speed and direction. Pilots also provide vital information regarding upper air weather observations and remain the only real-time source of information regarding turbulence, icing, and cloud heights. This information is gathered and filed by pilots in flight. Together, PIREFs and radio sound observations provide information on upper air conditions important for flight planning. Many domestic and international airlines have equipped their aircraft with instrumentation that automatically transmits in-flight weather observations through the data link system to the airline dispatcher who disseminates the data to appropriate weather forecasting authorities. Weather observers use four types of radar to provide information about precipitation, wind, and weather systems. The WSR-88D NEXRAD radar, commonly called Doppler radar, shown top left, provides in-depth observations that inform surrounding communities of impending weather. Doppler radar has two operational modes, clear air and precipitation. In clear air mode, the radar is in its most sensitive operational mode because a slow antenna rotation allows the radar to sample the atmosphere longer. Precipitation targets provide stronger return signals. Therefore, the radar is operated in the precipitation mode when precipitation is present, which can be seen on the top right. Intensities are correlated to intensity terminology for air traffic control purposes, shown on the bottom. FAA Terminal Doppler Weather Radar, installed at some major airports around the country, 
also aids in providing severe weather alerts and warnings to ATC. Terminal radar ensures pilots are aware of wind shear, gust fronts, and heavy precipitation. The third type of radar commonly used in the detection of precipitation is the FAA airport surveillance radar. This radar is used primarily to detect aircraft, but it also detects the location and intensity of precipitation, which is used to route aircraft traffic around severe weather in an airport environment. And the last type of radar is airborne radar. It is equipment carried by aircraft to locate weather disturbances. Advancement in satellite technologies has recently allowed for commercial use to include weather uplinks. Pilots now have the capability of receiving continuously updated weather across the entire country at any altitude. No longer are pilots restricted by radio range or geographic isolations, such as mountains or valleys. Shown on the left, SIGMEDs are weather advisories issued concerning weather significant to the safety of all aircraft. SIGMED advisories can cover an area of at least 3,000 square miles and provide data regarding severe and extreme turbulence, severe icing, and widespread dust or sandstorms that reduce visibility to less than 3 miles. Shown on the right, AIRMEDs are weather advisories issued only to amend the area forecast concerning weather phenomena which are of operational interest to all aircraft. AIRMEDs concern weather of less severity than that covered by segments or convective segments. AIRMEDs cover moderate icing, moderate turbulence, sustained winds of 30 knots or more at the surface, widespread areas of ceilings less than 1,000 feet, and or visibility less than three miles. And it's I'm gonna pause right here for just a second. <clears throat> so this thing is talking about SIGMETs and AIRMETs. Um, we, like in, in um, dispatch, and like as dispatchers, generally speaking, if you want to, in fact, if you wanna write this down as well, because this is something you'll wanna know, but Airmets are basically only for – they're really only more pertinent to lighter, smaller aircraft, like non-commercial aircraft. In dispatch – and the reason I kind of say that is because in dispatch, the only thing we really care about are SIGMETs. Those are for large aircraft. Well, it's for all aircraft, but SIGMETs, more specifically speaking – are in the category level of severe. So if it's in a SIGMET report, it means whatever it's reporting is considered at the severe level, whether that be severe turbulence, severe icing, severe, like, like it'll, if it has like a dust SIGMET, like a severe dust storm. Um, I mean, anything that weather-wise, if we talk about thunderstorms, those are called convective SIGMETs. And a convective segment is basically all of the – it's considered all of, like, the icing, the turbulence, the, the wind shear, um, like lightning, rain, hail, all of those things in one. So it can have all of those things. So convective segments are the worst because those are thunderstorms, and thunderstorms have all of the horrible weather, like, related stuff – associated with them so but individually you can still have icing turbulence um i always forget they're always draw a blank when i'm trying to name them all off but icing turbulence um uh wind dust i mean all you know anything you know that is considered severe enough for commercial aircraft to be concerned of it we normally don't even look at air mats at all so um, anyway, just wanted to kind of get that out there so that you guys kind of know that ahead of time. So, continue this. Extensive mountain obscurement. Service outlets are government or private facilities that provide aviation weather services. Major service outlets are the Automated Flight Service Station, or AFSS, the Transcribed Information Briefing Service, or TIBS the Direct User Access Terminal Service, or DUATS, 
the en route flight advisory service or flight watch, the hazardous in-flight weather advisory or HIWAS, and lastly, the transcribed weather broadcast or TWEP. The AFSS is the primary source for pre-flight weather information. A pre-flight weather briefing from an AFSS can be obtained 24 hours a day by calling 1-800-WX-BRIEF from almost anywhere in the United States. The Transcribed Information Briefing Service is a service prepared and disseminated by selected AFSS. It provides continuous telephone recordings of meteorological and aeronautical information. Specifically, TIPS provides area and route briefings, airspace procedures, and special announcements. The Direct User Access Terminal Service, DUATS, which is funded by the FAA, allows any pilot with a current medical certificate to access weather information and file a flight plan via computer. The en route flight advisory service is specifically designed to provide timely en route weather information upon pilot requests. Hazardous in-flight weather advisory is a national program for broadcasting hazardous weather information continuously over selected navigation aids. The broadcasts include advisories such as air mats, segments, convective segments, and urgent pyreps. These broadcasts are only a summary of the information, and pilots should contact an FSS or EFAS for detailed information. Shown above, Navigational aids that have HIWAS capability are depicted on sectional charts with an H in the upper right corner of the identification box. Transcribed weather broadcasts are only available in Alaska and are recorded on tapes and broadcast continuously over selected low or medium frequency and very high frequency omnidirectional radio range navigation system facilities. Generally, the broadcast contains a summary of adverse conditions, surface weather observations, PIREPs, and a density altitude statement, if applicable. At the discretion of the broadcast facility, recordings may also include a synopsis, winds aloft forecast, en route and terminal forecast data, and radar reports. Prior to every flight, pilots should gather all information vital to the nature of the flight. This includes an appropriate weather briefing obtained from a specialist at an FSS, AFSS, or NWS. For weather specialists to provide an appropriate weather briefing, they need to know which of the three types of briefings is needed. Standard, abbreviated, or outlook. Other helpful information is whether the flight is visual flight rules, VFR, or IFR, aircraft identification and type, departure point, estimated time of departure, ETD, flight altitude, route of flight, destination, and estimated time and route, ETE. I'm going to skip ahead here a little bit because this is nothing that you will ever do. Flight. This type of briefing is a good source of flight planning information that can influence decisions regarding route of flight, altitude, and ultimately the go-no-go -go decision. Aviation weather reports are designed to give accurate depictions of current weather conditions. Each report provides current information that is updated at different times. Some typical reports are METAR, PIREPS, and radar weather reports, SDs. Shown above is a METAR. A METAR is an observation of current surface weather reported in a standard international format. METARs are issued hourly unless significant weather changes have occurred. A special METAR, SPECI, can be issued at any interval between routine METAR reports. A typical METAR report contains the following information in sequential order. One, type of report, METAR. There are two different types of METAR reports. The first is the routine METAR report that is transmitted every hour. The second is the aviation selected SPECI. This is a special report that can be given at any time to update the METAR for rapidly changing weather conditions, aircraft mishaps, or other critical information. Two, station identifier, KGGG, a four-letter code as established by the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO. 
Above shows the identifier for Gregg County Airport in Longview, Texas, K being the country designation, and GGG being the airport identifier. Alaska identifiers always begin with the letters PA, and Hawaii identifiers always begin with the letters PH. Three, date and time of report, 161753Z, depicted in a six-digit group. The first two numbers stand for the day of the month. The last four stand for time converted to Zulu time, which is depicted at the end with the letter Z. Four, modifier, auto, denotes that the METAR came from an automated source or that the report was corrected. If the notation auto is listed in the METAR, the report came from an automated source. It also lists A01 or A02 in the remarks section to indicate the type of precipitation sensors employed at the automated station. When the modifier COR is used, it identifies a corrected report sent out to replace an earlier report that contained an error. 5. When 14021G26 reported with a five-digit code unless the speed of the wind is over 99 knots. The first three digits indicate the direction the true wind is blowing in tens of degrees. If the wind is variable, it is reported as VRB. The last two digits indicate the speed of the wind in knots. If the winds are gusting, the letter G follows the wind speed, followed by the peak gust recorded. Sit. So I want to go back to that for just a second. On the wind here. So it's important to know this is something um, that is kind of it's kind of backwards with the with the way wind is reported. When it says wind one four zero, okay, so that like they were saying it's that is the the degrees of where the wind is coming from, okay? So I know like in our world, we like to think of everything as like where we're headed. I'm headed east, I'm headed north, or you know, whatever, you know? But in terms of wind reports, um, and this is in any, any whether it's a METAR, a TAF, a PIREP, any aviation weather report, the wind is always going to be where it's coming from, okay? So when it says, in this case, 140, that means the wind is coming from the southeast, okay? So in this case, if you were to take the exact opposite of 140, so if we have a 360 degree, you know, possibility, what would the opposite of 140 be? Just add 180 to that. 220? Or two 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 eighty, right? Or is it yeah. one forty plus one eighty? You what? You add one eighty. Three twenty. Yeah, three twenty. Okay. So that means the wind is blowing three hundred at at three hundred twenty. So if you think about it, it's coming out of the southeast one hundred forty degrees and blowing like so. It's headed at three twenty, but it's coming from one forty. Okay. So it's just a little bit backwards. I just want everybody to know that just so. Um, it doesn't get too confusing. I know this lady is hard to listen to. So. The prevailing visibility. Yeah, it is. I'm trying to skip through as much as I can. trying to use the biggest words. Yeah. The ability is reported in statute miles as denoted by the letters SM. It is reported in both miles and fractions of miles. At times, runway visual range, RVR, is reported following the prevailing visibility. RVR is the distance a pilot can see down the runway in a moving aircraft. When RVR is reported, it is shown with an R, then the runway number, followed by a slant, then the visual range in feet. Seven, weather, plus TSRA, BR, can be broken down into two different categories qualifiers and weather phenomena. First, the qualifiers of intensity, proximity, and the descriptor of the weather will be given. The intensity may be light, minus, moderate, blank, or heavy, 
plus. Proximity only depicts weather phenomena that are in the airport vicinity. The notation VC indicates a specific weather phenomenon is in the vicinity of 5 to 10 miles from the airport. Descriptors are used to describe certain types of precipitation and obscurations. Weather phenomena may be reported as being precipitation, obscurations, and other phenomena such as squalls or funnel clouds. Descriptions of weather phenomena as they begin or end and hailstone size are also listed in the remarks section of the report. 8. Sky Condition BKN 008 OVC 012 CB Always reported in the sequence of amount, height, and type or indefinite ceiling height. The heights of the cloud bases are reported with a three-digit number in hundreds of feet AGL. The types of clouds, specifically towering cumulus, ECU, or cumulonimbus, CB clouds, are reported with their height. Contractions are used to describe the amount of cloud coverage and obscuring phenomena. The amount of sky coverage is reported in eighths of the sky from horizon to horizon. 9. Temperature and dew point, 18-17. The air temperature and dew point are always given in degrees Celsius. Temperatures below 0 degrees Celsius are preceded by the letter M to indicate minus. 10. Altimeter setting, A2970. Reported as inches of mercury, HG. In a four-digit number group, it is always preceded by the letter A. Rising or falling pressure may also be denoted in the remarks section as PRESRR or PRESFR, respectively. 11. Remarks. The remarks section always begins with the letters RMK. Comments may or may not appear in this section of the METAR. The information contained in this section may include wind data, variable visibility, beginning and ending times of particular phenomenon, pressure information, and various other information deemed necessary. PIREPs provide valuable information regarding the conditions as they actually exist in the air, which cannot be gathered from any other source. Pilots can confirm the height of bases and tops of clouds, locations of wind shear and turbulence, and the location of in-flight icing. When unexpected weather conditions are encountered, pilots are encouraged to make a report to an FSS or ATC. When a pilot weather report is filed, the ATC facility or FSS will add it to the distribution system to brief other pilots and provide in-flight advisories. The image above shows the elements of a PIREP form. Item numbers 1 through 5 are required information when making a report, as well as at least one weather phenomenon encountered. Pilot reports are easily decoded, and most contractions used in the reports are self-explanatory. Areas of precipitation and thunderstorms are observed by radar on a routine basis. Radar weather reports, RAYREPs, or storm detections, SDs, are issued by radar stations at 35 minutes past the hour with special report Skipping ahead. One is light and six is extreme. A TAF is a report established for the five statute mile radius around an airport. TAF reports are usually given for larger airports. Each TAF is valid for a 30 hour time period and is updated four times a day at 0000 Zulu, 0600 Zulu, 1200 Zulu, and 1800 Zulu. The TAF utilizes the same descriptors and abbreviations as used in the METAR report. The TAF indicates the following information in sequential order. One, type of report, TAF. A TAF can be either a routine forecast, TAF, or an amended forecast, TAF AMD. Two, ICAO station identifier, KPIR. Same identifiers as a METAR report. Three, date and time, 11, 11.30 Zulu. Date is the first two numbers, followed by the time being the last four numbers given in Zulu time. Four, valid period, date and time, 11, 12, 12. The valid forecast time period is given by a six-digit number group. 
The first two numbers indicate the date, followed by the two-digit beginning time for the valid period, and the last two digits are the ending time. Five, forecast when, 15012 KT. The wind direction and speed forecast are given in a five-digit number group. The first three indicate the direction of the wind in reference to true north. The last two digits state the wind speed in knots, as denoted by the letters KT. Six, forecast visibility, P6SM, given in statute miles, and may be in whole numbers or fractions. If the forecast is greater than six miles, it will be coded as P6SM. Seven, forecast significant weather. Weather phenomena are coded in the TAP reports in the same format as the METAR. If no significant weather is expected during the forecast time period, the denotation NSW is included in the becoming or temporary weather groups. Eight, forecast sky condition, given in the same manner as the METAR. Only cumulonimbus CB clouds are forecast in this portion of the TAP report as opposed to CBs and towering cumulus in the METAR. Nine, forecast change group. For any significant weather change forecast to occur during the TAF time period, the expected conditions and time period are included in this group. This information may be shown as from FM, becoming BECMG, and temporary tempo. FM is used when a rapid and significant change, usually within an hour, is expected. Becoming is used when a gradual change in the weather is expected over a period of no more than two hours. Tempo is used for temporary fluctuations of weather expected to last less than one hour. 10. Probability forecast. A given percentage that describes the probability of thunderstorms and precipitation occurring in the coming hours. This forecast is not used for the first six hours of the 24-hour forecast. The FA gives a picture of clouds, general weather conditions, and visual meteorological conditions, VMC, expected over a large area encompassing several states. There are six areas for which area forecasts are published in the contiguous 48 states. Area forecasts are issued three times a day and are valid for 18 hours. Area forecasts are typically disseminated in four sections and include the following information. One. Okay, who's ready to beat their head on the desk? Okay. She would like use a pointer or something because if I like blink to <laughs> yeah. low, like I lost track yeah. of where she's at and then I'm like, I don't even. Yeah, no, I hear you. So we're going to look at some TAFs and okay. METARs actually right now. Give us a break from her, whoever she is. If somebody wants to come up with a clever name for her, that'd be great. Barbara. Yeah. Barb. I'm going to call her Barb. Okay. Um, let me... Log in here real quick. Pull up some weather. Let's review some METARs and TAFs real quick. Who feels comfortable being able to decode a METAR or a TAF? I feel like I have the little like, code. Okay. I think there's some of it. Yeah. Okay. Garrett says he does. Okay. <laughs> Well, Garrett, Garrett should. He's been in this for like six years now. Right, Garrett? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I know. And I'm not going to do them. I can tell you that. Change <laughs> seven. <laughs> yeah, I actually just changed that the other day by request of some coworkers. Um, yeah, I want to be referred to as king around the LCC. <laughs> <laughs> so I changed my name on SkyWest Online. You can change your preferred name. 
Oh my mm-hmm. god. Some of the maintenance guys have hilarious ones. Like Happy Gilmore up in Salt Lake. Yeah, yeah. We see him all the time, but um there's one guy, it's Big Deal. Big Deal out oh, in Nashville. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The maintenance guys are more into it. Okay, Garrett. Well, get ready. I'm going to unmute you. You're going to read off uh, Mitar here in just a second. (laughs) Oh, sure. Excuses, excuses. (laughs) Just trim on this webcam. Are you going to read books? So how come they don't use like the three, yeah, I think the three airport code, three letter? They do. They just put a K in front of it. Oh, so every one of them has a K. Well, in the United all States. <laughs> well, unless Hawaii or Hawaii or Alaska are different. Yeah, Barb did. <laughs> if it's if it's Alaska, it starts with a P A. Hawaii, it's P H. And in the lower 48. Yep. Yesterday's. That was in yesterday's um, reading. Reading. Gary's sticking me to that and saying, Just, just looking to see where we have some weather here. So, do we not do international like, <laughs> reports and stuff? Or is that we do, like, but like, like at SkyWest, we only fly to Mexico and Canada, or sometimes like the Bahamas. But, uh, they they look the same. They just they just have a different like like Mexico it just has like M M M Y or whatever you know. So instead of like K, it just everything in Mexico starts with an M. I didn't even think of that. We only fly to Mexico and Canada. Yeah. Just assume we flew everywhere. <laughs> yeah, everything up in Canada starts with a C, and then a Y. It's like a C Y, and then like Calgary is C Y Y C. Winnipeg is C Y W G, Vancouver C Y V R. So, but yeah, you, city codes you, you just get to you know. Big map on it from yesterday's reading. Yeah. So let's look. Hey Garrett, can you see that there? <laughs> okay. Try talking though, so we can all hear you. <laughs> you there? You hear me? You hear me? Woo! Yeah, we actually hear you on the TV. Isn't that lovely? Nice, nice. Is it a week? No, you're good. All right. All right. So you, so you read the read that. Yeah, read that top one. All right. All right. So, so uh, uh, SLC. Which is where? Well, um, California. What? No, Salt Lake City. Um, so it's the. Oh man, I can't remember that first code, but the winds are 216 gusting to 23, 10 statute miles of visibility, uh, light rain. Hold on, you're reading the you're reading the bottom one. Oh, you want me to do the speci? Yeah, read the speci. Okay. All right. So it's the 23rd, it's 0109 Zulu. What's that? I can't remember. Just the oh, time yeah. And then 190, um, the winds are 190, 10 knots, gusting to 20 knots, 10 statute miles of visibility, light rain, few clouds at 6,500 feet, broken at 10,000, cumulonimbus, broken at 20,000, and then all that VOR. <laughs> Altimeter is 3016, remark. 
um that it's a it's a what is it the oh man precipitation vfr wind shift um zero zero four nine cumulonimbus i don't know what that ohd is but. all good all good yeah the the remarks uh normally most people don't know honestly but uh even current dispatchers so so yeah so let's just go back through it again salt lake city uh it is the 23rd of august at 109 zulu so now just remember everybody that uh in aviation everything goes off of utc time anybody heard of utc time yeah universal time coordinated um it's basically the time in greenwich england that's kind of what it's all based like the, the prime meridian you know yeah so gi on gmt so we call it zulu in aviation so when you hear it referred to as zulu everything we do every all of the time that we do is all in zulu but all of aviation is in zulu which honestly if you were to ask me i wish that the entire world was just in zulu so that everybody knew the same time instead of having time zones it's actually if you think about it it's actually a far better idea although it would be weird because now that we're used to like 1 a.m being dark you know um our dark would be like you know like seven zulu basically so generally speaking here in utah it's it's six hours um it's plus i believe it's pl or minus six hours so take the utc time minus six and that's usually about what we are when it's daylight uh, when it's not i think right now we're in daylight savings right or we're then not we're plus six so yeah so part of the year we're plus seven part of the year we're plus six anyway mm -hmm. But that's just another reason to have it be, you know, everybody on the same time. Anyway, so aviation, though, everybody is on the same time. Whether you're flying in Europe or you're flying here, it's all the same time. So um, it always gives you the time in Zulu. So the date is the 23rd. because it's, So it's already the 23rd of August in Zulu time. And 109 Zulu. And then the wind is coming from 190, 10 knots, and then gusting to 20 knots. 10 statute miles of visibility and then yeah so when we see a minus in front of precipitation that means light if you see no sign at all so the options would be either a plus sign or a minus sign um, if you see plus that means heavy if you see a minus that means light if you see no plus or minus it just means moderate so if that just said RA, that would mean moderate rain. But that means light rain the way it says right there. Few clouds, 6,500. So the elevation of the clouds or the AGL, that's always an AGL. So now remember, there's MSL and then there's AGL, okay? Mean sea level and then AGL stands for above ground level. So AGL um, in a METAR is what it's always going to be AGL. That means whatever the elevation of the airport is, it's just simply saying how high above the ground of the airport are the clouds. So like, if you know, in Salt Lake City, the elevation is roughly 4,300 feet above sea level. So if the clouds were being given in sea level as well, then few at 6,500 would really mean that the clouds were only 2,200 feet above the ground. So but in a METAR report and in all weather reports, it should always be in AGL, okay? Even if the airport's at sea level, it will still be AGL? It will always be AGL, correct. So it's the height above the ground. Okay, that next one, broken 10,000, and then the CB on the end of it just means it's cumulonimbus is the cloud type. The only time you'll ever see... Um, a cloud type denoted on the end of a of a ceiling or a, or a sky condition is if it's cumulonimbus. You will not see any other cloud type other than cumulonimbus. Um, then broken, 20,000. Then the temperature is 26 degrees Celsius, and then over 12 degrees is the dew point. 
altimeter 30.16. And then that remark AO2 just means the AO2 just means that it came from an automated source. That's what the AO2 means. And then those remarks wind shift to 0049, cumulonimbus overhead moving north. That's all that all of that means. But the remarks, honestly, some of them I know, some of them I don't know. It just happens to be that I know that one. Um, but a lot of them, honestly, I don't know. But don't be too concerned about the remarks, honestly. Just know the basis, everything leading up to where it says remark, you'll want to know. But that's what you need to become familiar with because ultimately as we're looking at weather down the road, especially when we get into flight planning, you, this is how you're going to be looking at weather. You're, you, you can look at charts and things like that, but when you look at what the specific weather is at, a, at your origin, your destination, your alternate airports, you're going to be looking at METARs and TAFs. And honestly, that's all you do all day long in, in real dispatch as well. So um, that next one was the previous METAR. So you can see that one for Salt Lake was a speci, right? And the reason... Let's see if we can figure out what the reason of that was. Wind shift. It looks, yeah, it looks looks like the wind shift. Um, yeah, because that's really the biggest thing that changed. Ten degrees. Uh, it changed two degrees. Ten knots. Yeah, it changed by. Yeah, well, the gust changed by three, the overall, but the direction changed by ten. So, anyway, I'll just read that one off. So, Salt Lake City, the 23rd day at 0054 Zulu. And that one says it means it's corrected. The TAF, it was reissued because it was corrected. So, if it's not a regularly scheduled TAF, then it'll say either speci or corrected like this. That's how you know that it's not regular. Um, wind 200 at 16 knots, gusting to 23 knots. 10 statute miles visibility, light rain, few at 6,500, broken 10,000, cumulonimbus, broken 12,000, and broken 18,000. Uh, temperature 28 over 8 degrees on the dew point. Now remember, you'll always only get Celsius as well. You'll never see Fahrenheit ever again. In aviation. So yes. Zulu. Celsius. Two big things. You'll never see regular time and you'll never see Fahrenheit. Um, altimeter 3016 remark. Same thing. Automated. Uh, this remark here means lightning distant south. That RAB means rain began at 52. That means, so if you were to go back to the time, this was issued at 54, and the rain began at 52. So two minutes. That that actually might have been why the, this TAF was issued, as corrected, yeah. It's because of the rain beginning. That's another reason you'll get a speci is if precipitation begins or ends. So uh, rain began at 52 past the hour, then that... Next one is sea level pressure, and that would be you have to convert it, but it, those are in millibars. Uh, cumulonimbus overhead moving stationary and distant south. So anyway, that's a METAR. Let's look at one other METAR. Who in here wants to volunteer to do this next one? I'll do it. Okay. Me Tell me bigger. what airport you want. Yeah, yeah I can go bigger. It's like kilometers. Gotcha. That time Name any airport you want. Just tell me the airport. San Fran. This might be a dumb question, but how can we, like, why would they put out taps if you have meat jars every hour? Like, what's the point? Because like, aren't taps just like what it should be, or what it's like? A taf is a forecast of what it's what they think it's going to be later. So when you are dispatching a flight to an airport, the most prevalent weather product that you're going to look at is the TAF. You don't necessarily, like if there's a thunderstorm over the field right now, like in San Francisco as an example, you, let's say you're dispatching a flight from Salt Lake to San Francisco. 
your flight's going to get there. Now think about it this way. You you send the flight. You do all the preparation about 90 minutes to two hours before the flight leaves. Mm -hmm. The flight itself is going to take about two to two and a half hours to leave, fly, arrive, right? So you're looking potentially four, four and a half hours down the road. So if there's a thunderstorm going on in San Fran right now, is that really – Relevant or relevant, relevant to what it might be in four and a half hours. Yeah. So the TAF, the TAF is just telling you what is expected over the next 24, and it'll break down the times. But we're going to look at TAFs in just a minute, though. Forecast rather than yeah. Forecast rather than current conditions. So. Well, a METAR definitely is more correct than a TAF. However, a METAR doesn't represent what might happen, be happening in four hours. Like if they expect fog to move in later this evening and move in over the field, it might not be there right now, but later they might be forecasting quarter mile visibility because fog, as soon as the sun sets, they might have some evection fog that moves over. So you can see that on the TAF. You'd see that in the TAF. Okay. So it might be – perfectly nice clear weather there now but when you're supposed to get there in four hours it might be expected to be no visibility so that's why yeah that's definitely why we care so good okay so this is K San Francisco. Um, the twenty third day is zero zero five six Zulu. Um, two eighty degrees. The wind is coming from two eighty degrees at twenty two knots. Um, ten statute miles. Fuel fourteen. Hmm. This one's different. So. I'm guessing there's a few clouds. So, yeah, so think about, so the but the 14 is. It's 14. 14. So think about it in this, these numbers are always going to be in hundreds of feet. So 1,400 feet. Yep. Um, and you at 200,000. Or 200,000. Oh, two. <laughs> <laughs> Um, moving ahead. Okay. Temperature. <laughs> temperature is 19. Dew point is 13 degrees Celsius. Um, and altimeter is 29.98. And then remarks. Um, what's PK? Peak. Peak wind. Let's see. And then, oh, I don't know. So it's still just a wind report there. Oh, okay. Um, so, I still don't get it. So peak wind was peak coming from 280, oh, coming from 280. at 27, 27 knots. Yeah. And, then, and that the next part there is telling you the time that that oh, happened. Okay. So about 34 minutes ago. Oh. Yeah, few clouds. All of those are sky conditions. So few clouds at 1,400, few clouds at 20,000, and that's it. Is SLP like slight? Sea level pressure. Sea level pressure. You did say that. And that part I always forget too. So the time, 56, that's a minute, right? Yeah. So it's midnight, 56. Zero 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 is midnight. Zero zero zero. So it's twelve fifty six. So yeah, it'd be midnight. This yeah, twelve. This would be yeah zero zero five six. So yeah, it would be. Yeah, military time. Other than just that, it's zero zero. Like their midnight Zulu is more like seven o'clock or six o'clock here. It's minus six. Is that you said? Yeah. Minus six right now in mountain time. Yeah. So. Okay. So I didn't do that very good. Give me a better one. Okay. I thought you did a good job. Yeah, I thought you did a good job. Let's do one from the Miami. One more? Miami. Miami? Yeah. 
Okay. So you're good? Miles, few clouds at 2,500, yep. and a few at 8,300. 8, 8,000. 8, 8, 8, okay. And then the temperature is 30 degrees Celsius over 24 degrees Celsius dew point. And then the altimeter is 29.98, and then the marks. Yep. Okay. Who's next? Yeah. Who's next? Yeah. 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 Okay. Pick your poison. To Hawaii. You want oh. Honolulu? Yeah. <clears throat> P H N L. Oh yeah. Yeah, these are these are the current ones. And these only happen to like tower there. Don't check that. I want it. I want it. No, no, they happen any anywhere. Anywhere that has a sauce, a was like Saint. We can look up Saint George. Yeah, Cedar, Saint George. Yeah, anywhere, even non towered Okay. All right. So it's Honolulu Airport. Um, the 23rd at 0053 Zulu. And then you got, it's coming from 70 degrees at 16 knots, gusting to 24 knots. And then uh, 10 statute miles of visibility. A um, few clouds at 2,500 feet. And then they're scattered at 47. 100 feet, and then uh, you got 29 over 21, and 21 is a dew point, there's 29 degrees Celsius. Um, so dew point's 21? Yeah. Okay, I thought you said 29. Okay. No, 29 is the degrees. Okay, cool. And then um, the altimeter is 29.98, and then marks, it's automated. Um, the SOP was the sea line pressure at 153, 2, I don't remember what you said, 2 was, but, yeah, we didn't do any of it. I remember it somewhere in the reading, but I don't remember what it said it was, yeah. so. Well, if you remember it, let me know, because I don't remember it. So. <laughs> so I remember seeing it in the reading, I just can't remember exactly what they said. So was that like confusing, having... Like how these are all saying it's the 23rd, and it's really the 22nd? No, because once you step in and start dispatching, you're on, your head is Zulu. So it doesn't matter. Everything you're looking at Zulu, so unless you're looking at when you go home, that's the only time you're going to look at the main. Is that a watch to Zulu time? Um, no, but I do do all of my time in 24 hours. Oh, no. How does that help you with Zulu time, though? It doesn't help me with Zulu, but it does help me because it's 24-hour format. So, like, when I'm looking at, well, I don't know, I mean, like, you just start, if you just start doing it this way, you just now remember all your numbers. Like, you automatically know 19 is 7 o'clock. 
you know. So just all that stuff is the only reason. That, it doesn't help you here. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't help no, at all. Really but know. the problem is, well, if you look at when and it, for not so much for the dispatchers, but for the regional controllers, when you look at one of our one of our systems that we use is called the plot. All of the flights are listed on there, and they have them all in local time, but they list them in the 24-hour format. So that's mostly why I do it. But for a dispatcher, they don't really ever even look at that. So I just do it just for that. I guess if you wanted to, you could always set it to that place or whatever. Yeah, I used to have it. I used to have it so that I had local, and then it had it listed two times. It listed Zulu underneath it. Who wants to go now? Chicago. Any specific Chicago? O'Hare. O'Hare? You guys are picking easy ones. I'm, I'm getting, I'm trying to, I pulled up the weather one. I'm trying to find a hard one. Looks like Southern Tennessee is going to be fun. That's why I pulled up Salt Lake. <laughs> Southern Tennessee. And I'm trying to find Southern a university. university. I'm trying to find some sort of like Kansas. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> is that a tornado at 50,000 knots? Yeah, I would just say wind from three two zero. Um, I turn the settings to 29.95. Mark is auto. SLP up <coughs> Sea level pressure. Sea level pressure, 139. Nice. Cool. Okay. Anybody else? What is Columbia, Tennessee? We fly there. Mm, I don't think we, we don't fly to Columbia, Tennessee. We fly to Columbia, Missouri. In Columbia, South Carolina. Where are you seeing? Yeah. Okay. That's what I was looking at earlier. When I when I was looking at it, it looked like like I think I want to say Reno probably has weather. Yep, oh, sure does. Oh, right now most of that is <laughs> most of that is in remarks. Let me see if I can find a different one. Oh, MRC. KMRC. KMRC. Murray County, Columbia, Tennessee. Ooh, it looks pretty nice. <laughs> Let's just look at uh, we'll just look at the radar. When it's winter, is are these like pretty crazy? Ah, uh, they can be, depending on where you're looking. So, what would you say is like the worst overall season for just across all country flights? Winter, obviously, or is it getting even worse? Like. In it depends on what specific type of weather you're looking for because like for instance winter is going to be more for like seeing like the low visibility stuff or like freezing fog things like that but like summertime along like the california coast you're going to see a lot of low visibility for just regular like fog along you know that area so so i like to look at Areas like, so if you look at this here, let's see, that's Lubbock. Amarillo might. Um, yeah, we'll look at this area here. Let's see. 
Where was Miller staying? 400, 500? Those are the tops of the clouds. Can you explain like the wind direction, like how does it come from just a regular like north? Okay, that's what I was thinking. I just want to make sure. Okay, for Lubbock, we'll look at some of those charts too. So where it seems to come from. We have that big chart. Yeah, I'm gonna. It's easy. Yeah, it's like they're fives. Yeah. That's why we were so confused. Yeah. It's going to tell me where it was. It's going to be so much easier now, though. Oh, oh, I can. Yeah. Okay. Somebody want to give this one a stab, this this one right here? I will. Okay. Um, the 23rd day. Well, well what city? <laughs> that is Lubbock. Texas. West Texas. The 23rd at 0053 Zulu. From 040 with 13 knots wind gusts up to 20 knots. Seven statute miles and light TSRA. Okay, so do you know what the AR? You know? Storms and rain. Yeah. So now this one is going to be a little bit different though on how you actually say it. So when you have a thunderstorm, um, you don't exit. So the, the, even though the minus sign is in front of the TS, um, the the minus is actually only related to the rain. Okay. So in this case, you would say light rain. Thunder and thunderstorm. So yeah, a thunderstorm will never be denoted as light or heavy. Well, it's any of the severe weather, right? So if it's like sandstorm and then, well, I guess it would work with that, but like, like hail and then you could do light rain or whatever, mist or whatever it is. Yeah, you could have, yeah, there could be, severe. you could see FG in there, you could say, and you'll see it all when we look at it more, but yeah, like GR would be hail. Uh, you could see BLDU, which is blowing dust. Um, there's a lot of different things you can see. So, but yeah, go ahead. New clouds at 700 feet broke in at uh, 4500 feet. That's right. Yep. Overcast at 6500 feet, 19 degrees, 18 degrees, dew point. Um, the altimeter setting is 30.17. The marks automatic peak wind at um, 360, 38 knots. And that's also the same as you said, from 235 to 5 knots. So that part right there is the actual timestamp. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. That's when the peak wind occurred. Was it 2355 of the previous hour? Um, LTG. Lightning. 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 That, that would be distant. So lightning, distant, and then the ALQDS stands for all quadrants is what it stands for. So when an ASOS or an AWAS, which is like what this is, it, it's actually doing the report. It divides. It, it's looking in a 360 degree rotation, you know, or you know, all all the way around. It, it's shooting out its, um, you know, its equipment measuring stuff in all directions. But it measures it just like you would see, like like in a, you know, like if you're looking at like a graph, like a math graph, how you have it like divided, and you have like the top left, top right, you know. So it's looking at a, each quadrant basically. So you have. You could say like your northwest quadrant, northeast quadrant, southeast quadrant, southwest quadrant. So when it gives you the directions, it's basically just telling you, you know, it'll, it'll either say north or south or it'll say northeast or southeast. So you know where it is. But when it says all quadrants, it just means lightning. It's, it's picking up lightning in all directions. That's all. 
saying there. Then the sea level pressure, um, that CONS is constant lightning, and then the IC means in clouds. So, yeah, constant lightning in clouds. Yeah. And then that would be south to southwest. The thunder, then it says a thunderstorm is south to southwest, moving southeast. Cumulonimbus distant north, east, and southeast, moving southeast. So the sea level pressure. It's really exciting. How does the light start to understand it? <laughs> What's that? How does the sea level pressure play into this? You know, honestly, it, it doesn't. Like for a dispatcher, the only the only reason it's in there is because some aircraft, depending on who the manufacturer is, the instrumentation reads in sea level pressure. And so, you know, if they get the weather report, they just need to be able to. Just like an altimeter setting. Exactly. Yeah. But for you and as a dispatcher, you'll never really care too much about it unless you dispatch like internationally or things. So. Um, okay, let's look at this TAF now for for Lubbock as well. So the TAF. This is the one that goes like from this time to this time, and when you're looking at it, yeah, it's like a vortex. Yeah. But this is what we're when you're dispatching, you have to look at the time that you're going to get there, so you have to look like in between certain ones. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the TAF is going to be broken down into different forecast periods. Okay. So this TAF was issued. The 23rd at 0044Z. So the TAFs are, remember, they're issued every six hours. Okay. They're divided up. According to Zulu time, they're issued in the 00Z hour, the 0600Z hour, the 1200Z hour, and the 1800Z hour. So, so that you're not going to always necessarily see it like right smack on the dot like 1800Z issued. Usually it's about 30 minutes before that. So like for instance, if this were the 1800Z, you would normally see this, it would say like 1730 Zulu. But it's, it's the, the valid period is for the 18Z time frame. So this one here is an amended TAF, so it's not a regularly scheduled one. That's why you see it at 0044. So anyway, so the TAF amended for Lubbock, 23rd day, 0044 Zulu is when it was issued. It's valid from the 23rd day from 01 Zulu to the 23rd at 24 Zulu. So that's the valid period of the TAF. Um, so starting with the 01, okay, that's this top line. This top line is going to be 01. It's, the, it's expected to be 130, wind 130 at 8 knots. In a TAF, you will never see visibility of better than what you see right here, P6SM. That is the best visibility you can see. The P, in this case, means greater than. Okay, so if you think, if you go back to when we were looking at the, the, the plus and the minus sign in the, in the METARs, another thing that you might see in a METAR is you might see a P instead of a plus sign. Okay, so you can see it either way, just depending on the station of the airport you're looking at. But if you see P, that would be a plus sign. If you see an M, that's a minus sign. So it still means heavier light? It still means heavier light, yeah, as a as a designator for precipitation. But in this case, the P, in a TAF you'll never see other than seeing it as like right here, the plus or the minus. For visibility, you'll, you'll never see a plus or a minus, though. You'll always just see a P. So that just means greater than six statute miles. But that's the best visibility you'll get in a TAF. You'll never see 10 miles. You'll never see 7, 8, 9. You'll see 6 or lower. 
then scattered, 5,000. Broken, 15,000. Overcast, 25,000. That's, that, that's basically the first line. This next line is saying that there's a, a tempo or a temporary forecast that's valid from 2301, so the 23rd day from 01 to the 23rd day at 02, so one hour. And during that one hour, it's expected to be wind 030 at 10 knots, six statute miles, light rain, thunderstorm, broken 4,000 cumulonimbus, overcast 8,000. So another important thing to see on here too, it's not ever going to give you altimeter. It's not ever going to give you the uh, temperature or dew point. Okay, the only thing you're ever going to see in a TAF is wind, visibility, and sky condition. That's it. And well, you will see precipitation type if there's any forecasted, but you'll never see. It's better just to say what you'll never see, and you're never going to see temperature or altimeter in a TAF. And the the other thing is too is so the top line of a TAF is basically considered um, it's is the first forecast line. Anytime you see these these FM marks like from, so they stands, it stands for from, but anytime you see a from, that represents a new forecast line. Um, when we get down the road looking at FARs and when we look at like when planes need alternates and things like that, that becomes very important to, to know the difference between temporary and from, because a from is, is considered an entirely new forecast, whereas a temporary is just just a, a temporary condition that's expected to occur within that previous forecast. Okay, so when we start out, and this is kind of gets a little confusing. So, but the more you hear this, the more we go over it, the more it's going to make sense. So, if it doesn't make too much sense right now, don't worry too much about it because we're, we're going to hit this over and over and over. So, um, so that first top line is your first forecast line. And then this next line is a temporary. So if you can see, the, the next line here says this is for the 23rd day starting at 4 Zulu. Okay. So if this next one starts at 4 Zulu, go back up to this line for just a second, right? This temporary thing that we just read is expected to occur between 01 and 02 for one hour. So... If this is only from 0, 01 to 0, 02, then after this is over, where do we refer in order for what we expect to be the weather? Back to the top. Yes. Okay. So, so unless this one, you know, started at two Zulu, then you would now go down to it. But since there's a two-hour gap between the end of this tempo and the start of the next forecast line then you go, actually, you refer back to the top one because the top one is from 0, 1Z to 4Z, technically. It's until, the, it's until the next one begins. If there's a tempo remark in there, it's just for that time that it states. Everything before that and everything after it is going to refer back to the original line. Okay? So the next one, 4Z... Wind 0, 1, 0, 10 knots, greater than 6 statute miles, scattered 3,000, broken 5,000, overcast 15,000. So this thing also, when it changes forecast, like when you get a new from line or even a tempo line, it's only going to list what is expected to change. Okay? So if you see something in here, like let's say up here, it said, let's say that the clouds weren't expected to change. In the new from line, you would potentially only just see just a visibility change. If you just see a visibility change, or if let's say you just see a ceiling like with no visibility, then that just means that the only thing expected to change is just that item. Whatever the previous one was is expected to be the same. So okay? visibility hasn't changed in this, so it's both, it's 
Yeah, and sometimes you will see that. Like sometimes it will just repeat it. But I'm just saying in the case that it doesn't, which is probably more rare now because they, they've kind of started to standardize them a little bit more. Now, in most cases, you'll still see it list all of them, even if they are the same. But just in the case that you, let's say you read that and it didn't have the visibility. Well, if it didn't, then you would just refer back. Yeah, that, that's probably the better way to say it. Because, yes, you will see, you'll see repeats. So um, then that next one, um, starting from 6 Zulu, when 0, 3, 0, 6 knots, 3 statute miles, what is BR? Does anybody know what BR is? Stands for mist. 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 Yeah, it is weird. It's like that one, and sand. Sand. Mist. Oh, mist. Mist. Well, that, well. <laughs> but it, it. But now that you know, it it won't. <laughs> yeah, smoke is the easiest one. It's just f you. Yeah. How come there? Like B R. Is there like a certain reason why it's B R? It's French. Whatever mist is in French is something is B R. Well, the F U. The F U is like from Latin. Because it's it's fumo. Which is smoke in Latin or Spanish, even. So, F U. I know. And then that's what they. Because then it wouldn't be interesting. It would be nice if they actually just wrote everything out. Like, by the way, at Lubbock, at 20, on the 23rd, 44 minutes after. How long would that be? Yeah, just, then it'd be just like full paragraphs. This year's done, so I'm going to cut because then everybody would understand. Oh, it. say, would be, yeah, it'd be, would be, it'd be a real no. shame if you know everybody who's operating an aircraft knew what the money was. <laughs> be a real shame. So 1800 Zulu. It doesn't change much there. Anyway, that's a tap. So overall, this is basically saying the clouds are going to start coming lower, and then they're going to go back up. And after the seven, let's see. So after the 1800 hour, then it just goes back to what it was at the time. Well, so no, this one, so this one being the last line here, this is anything after this. So that's the thing about the from lines. So if once you see a new from line, everything before that is just erase it, pretend that it doesn't exist. So the from lines are officially new forecast lines. So anything from that point after, that is now what they refer to as the main body of the TAF. So once you get a new from line, it just means everything before it, I mean, literally you could just erase it because you will not need it. You can't, you don't refer back to it. So the from 1800 line on the bottom, once that starts, everything before that is invalid. Even that top one? Yep, even the top one. The top one is just a from line, okay. but it just doesn't say it because it's the top line. But it's from zero one to zero four. Okay. Yeah. I have a question about the temporary because um, the twenty third and that's O one hundred, right? Alex? Correct. I'm just supposed to know that that's O one hundred because everything else has four digits, right? Yep. Oh, the temporal. Six hundred, eighteen hundred. Yep. The tempo remarks are always going to be the two digit date and the two digit time. That's the only time you're going to see it different. A lot of people think that that just means for one minute, yeah. 2301 to 2302. So yeah, don't make that mistake. But it uh, it, it means 23rd day 0100 to the 23rd day 0200. Let's look at another TAF real quick. Let's go back to Salt Lakes because Salt Lakes had some good ones. Mm. Not awesome. Okay. 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 Well, let's look at this one for a minute. 
We're going to look at the top two lines on this one here first. So, so once again, this is an amended TAF. So it came out at a non-scheduled time, 23rd day at, at 129 Zulu. Um, valid from the 23rd at 01 to the 24th at 06. So this one is a is a 24-hour half. So wind 190, 10 knots, gusting to 18 knots, greater than 6 statute miles, light rain showers is what that stands for, light rain showers. VCTS, anybody know what that is? Vicinity thunderstorms. So when it says that, when it says vicinity, like let's say if it, if it said TS, like they would end up switching the TS and they'd actually put it here, you know. Yeah. But when it says VCTS, the only thing that that means to us is that it's not over the airport. That's that's all it really means. It's not over the airport. It's in the vicinity, but not over. Scattered 7,000 cumulonimbus, broken 10,000. The next line from 23 at 0, 0,500. So now everything before this is now invalid. Wind 16008, greater than 6 statute miles, vicinity showers, and then scattered 8,000, broken 10,000. Then you can see the other ones as we go on. Just changes the the clouds is all. Um, what was the other one you were saying? JFK. Okay. Let's see what's kind. Okay. So this one has a couple of different tempo remarks in it. So our first one here obviously is starting from 0, 01. We get wind 190 at 20, gusting to 28, greater than 6 statute miles, few 5,000, broken 25,000. And we get a from 23 at 0, 300. When 220, 18 gusting to 25 knots, six statute miles, light rain showers, vicinity thunderstorms, scattered 2,000, broken 5,000 cumulonimbus. Now you get a temporary remark in there from 0,300 to 0,400, three statute miles, moderate rain and thunderstorm, broken 2,000 cumulonimbus. Then you get a new forecast, 2300 at 04, 23rd day at 0400, wind still 220, gusting to 25, six statute miles, mist, scattered 2000, broken 5000, temporary remark. So this is a three hour temporary remark from the 23rd at 0400 to the 23rd at 0700, five statute miles, light rain showers, broken 2000. And then the rest of the day there, pretty much the same. Yeah. What's that bottom one right here? What's this SKC mean? Sky's clear. Sky's clear. Sky clear. <laughs> Sky clear. You guys want to take a break for a minute? Yeah. yeah. It's kind of cool. You just read those and visualize what's going on with the clouds coming in, coming down, and moving out. Just by reading this one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it kind of just becomes secondhand just reading them. But yeah, you'll by the end of this class, it'll be just that easy for all of you guys, though, too. Yeah, so don't be too worried about the Zulu time. It's, it's not really as much of a transition as you think it is because when you're in there, if you think about everything you're looking at, 
everything you're looking at is already telling you Zulu. So when you see my flight's supposed to leave at 0100, like that's when your flight's supposed to depart, you know? And then the ETA is going to be 0400. But everything you're looking at, because everything on the TAF, the METARs, your departure times, everything on your software that you're looking at, everything's in Zulu. So you really don't even have to, like, think local time. But what about, I guess, so maybe I'm getting too far ahead of myself. But when you, like, sit down for your day and you have, like, your list of flights, I guess that... And you would just have to make sure that you're giving your flight plan two hours before. So, you, I don't know. I'm sure it's easier than <laughs> it is. It is because everything's listed still in Zulu. Okay, right. And so, and your your software, even your time on your computer is Zulu. Oh, okay. So that's cool. Everything that you're looking at is Zulu. So the thing is, is and the other thing too is when when a flight is due, like it needs to be sent. Yeah. It turns colors. Okay. So everything you're looking at is yeah. So that part, don't even worry about that okay. part because that's that that that's the least of your concerns. Okay. Is, is the time. <laughs> that I just got to figure out Celsius. <laughs> the Celsius thing, same deal. Everything you're looking at is Celsius, so it really doesn't make too much of a difference. The only the only thing is ultimately, I mean, you'll start automatically developing a sense of what that Celsius temperature is in Fahrenheit, you know? So like as an example, 10 degrees Celsius is 50 degrees Fahrenheit, roughly. 20 degrees Celsius is about 68 Fahrenheit. When you get up to the really hot temperatures, like a really, really hot temperature would be like anything over, really anything over like 37, 38 degrees Celsius is where you're starting to get high 90s into the hundreds here. So, so like 40, I think it's like 40 degrees in between all that. Uh, that's the problem. It like just depends. Degrees. It's a fluctuating scale. So the lower you get, like as an example, zero degrees Celsius is freezing. So that's another thing that's kind of easier is because you know that 30, well, you know 32 degrees Fahrenheit is freezing, but that's 30, that's zero degrees Celsius. So, because a big thing for you is is freezing like in aviation so but just knowing that it's zero but then on the flip side negative 32 degrees fahrenheit is not um it, like it doesn't translate the same in other words so the like for instance they end up meeting up like like i want to say like negative. negative 40 degrees celsius is negative 40 degrees fahrenheit so that, so you can't really just say minus 40 or add 40 because it's uh, every degree is it changes and it spreads. The hotter you get, the higher the spread. The colder you get, the closer the spread. So it's kind of hard. Just when I was like in Europe, they were always trying to like make it so I'd understand that they're like it's pretty much just minus 40 or whatever. So they would always say that. So it makes more sense that way though. Yeah, it's it's tough. Like. You just have to kind of think about it in your head. Like, you just end up, you know, once you see it enough, you'll just start like, okay, well, that's more or less this. The thing is, is you don't ever see a Fahrenheit degree anyway, so it doesn't really matter too much, you know? So what's a nautical mile versus a regular mile? One's less. Is there like a perfect gap on that? Yeah, about yeah, they're, that. They're a direct conversion. Yeah. Yeah, nautical and statute, yeah. That's the other thing too. Is like even that. Like, there's never even a need to even know the, even that conversion. You know, you just yeah. I guess it's just like an understanding of maybe how fast they're going or what temperature it feels like. That's what like I referring yeah. so that maybe we just understand it more rather than just being able to read it. Yeah, and the, that's but that's the thing though. Like, and, and I get exactly what you're saying because when I first was trying to learn it, that's exactly what I was trying to think and figure out. But the thing is, is you start realizing that you actually never have even a need to even know. So it it becomes then you start thinking unless you're just simply curious and you just want to know. Like that's the only reason I even know that that 10 degrees is 50 degrees and that 20 degrees is 68. It's just because I'm like, huh, I wonder what that is in Fahrenheit. But that it's other than me just simply being curious, it was the only reason I even looked at it at all. So, like, um, pilots will always tell you, well, the only reason they even know it is because when they do, like, an announcement on a plane, yeah. they do the conversion. 
But the only reason they even know is because when they, they have a little thing next to their throttle that does the conversion for them. They just like, let's see, 10 is 50, 15 is 60, you know, whatever. So it uh, they even they don't know or necessarily remember it, you know. So the other thing is, is even your speeds. When you're looking at your aircraft speeds um, and you're wondering how fast that is, Everything we do, and you'll learn this later, but everything we do with relation to aircraft speed is going to be in what's called indicated airspeed. It's not even how fast it's really going. Oh. So, like for instance, when a plane's up high at high altitude, 35,000, 36, 37,000 feet flying, they fly because the air is less dense up there. The plane, that the important thing is what how fast does the plane think it's going? That's kind of what you're really more or less looking at. Because when you're in that it's it's it it kind of throws you for a loop a little bit because cars, you start to try to relate everything to a car. Yeah. And that's that's the first problem is because a car is attached to the ground. Yeah. Nothing is going to affect it, not even wind. Wind will, I mean, it'll affect it. It'll make your gas mileage worse if you've got a strong headwind. But whatever your miles per hour says on your speedometer, that is literally how fast you're going, right? Yeah. Because even if you're going 80 and you have a 50 mile wind blowing at, you know, blowing at you, all you're doing is just pressing the gas harder to maintain 80. You're, but you're still going 80, right? Yeah. Well, if you're in a plane, it's totally different because it's not attached to the ground. So no matter how much they press the gas down, they can make themselves go faster, but no matter what, whatever that speed says, it, you have to minus off the wind speed off of it in order to get the true speed. So when you're looking at like aircraft speeds, you're looking at indicated airspeed. There's, there's a bunch of different speeds. There's indicated airspeed, there's true airspeed, and then there's ground speed. So not that you really care about most of them, but um, indicated is what the most important is for a plane because all of your power settings and everything, all of your fuel burn, everything else is based off of how fast the plane thinks it's going. So, for instance, it can be when it's up at high altitude, the plane thinks it's only going, say, 250, but it's really going 500, 600 miles an hour because of the air pressure differences. But it doesn't know that it's going that fast because the power because of the air pressure and everything else it thinks that it's only going 250 so it's kind of crazy but you never you never really there's never a need to know it and so yeah yeah other than just simply being interested and curious um, you never really figure it out you do when we do manual flight planning because you end up calculating winds and stuff and then you have to figure out the time and stuff but Outside of that, you'll you'll never actually even look at it again. So, yeah. So, um, pedo tube. Yeah. The pedo tubes. Speed is it going? Like how fast the turbines are going? Ram air. Part of it. Um, the those are there's well there's there's different there's a whole bunch that, that's the thing there's a whole bunch of different speeds but like the, the fan speeds those are called those are those are called your n speeds like n1 speed n2 speed which you'll see later but it those are really just more of like power setting speeds so like kind of like a boat like when you're in a boat and so you prop comes out of the water you'll see you're like 70 all of a sudden but you're not going any faster no. Yeah. It just goes off how fast the prop is spinning. So exactly. Kind of yeah, it, it kind of is a little bit. Like for instance, it'll it'll go way up if you get like wind shear mm -hmm. and you get wind blowing into it. Mm -hmm. It'll think that it's going. Right. Yeah, you'll get an overspeed when you're really slowing down. Right. You know, so it yeah, it's it's kind of weird, but yeah, most of it's not dispatch related, so it it's not usually too much of a concern. But um. Anyway, so weather charts. Um, I know we're not going to get through, obviously, all the weather charts. So part of it will just have to be, well, we can go back to Barb. She explains a lot of it. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but 
But anyway, the rest of this thing basically goes over weather charts. So we won't necessarily do that in here, but just know like you'll, you'll probably want to go back and watch the tail end of this. And I'll, I'll link it to like right where it starts. And I'll just give you a new link so that it just goes to right where the charts portion starts. Um, but let's just go back to our WSI thing here and let's look at charts. So this whole thing is basically meant to just look at the different types of charts that we have available to us. So in aviation, we have just tons and tons of different weather charts to be able to look at and that tell us different things based on what we want to know. So just looking at these, the first one we're actually going to look at is a surface analysis chart, which is top right over here. I'm going to try to zoom in. That's showing up pretty good. Yeah, not bad. So a surface analysis chart is just simply giving us a depiction of what is going on just along the surface of, well, in this point, you know, for this, it's just the continental United States that we're looking at here. So all of this <clears throat> is just a snapshot, really, <clears throat> excuse me, of of what weather is like now. So, you know, it's showing us, it's giving a mixture of things. It's giving us a satellite image of the clouds. It's giving us a radar image, which is the green of, you know, some of the different precipitation that's out there. That's the Doppler radar imaging. It's giving us high and low pressure systems that are out there. It's giving us frontal boundaries. Um, it's giving us pressure points as well. So you can see these little smoother center lines and then you see these like 1020, 1016, 1012. Those are your sea level pressure, your millibars. Honestly, I've never really, for me, like, like the millibar thing, the, the pressure, like I've never really had much of a use for it. Um, there's a lot of things like in here, there's a lot of different charts and things that are available for you to look at. I would say the majority of dispatchers probably don't know what most of it even is. Like, like if they're like, they're not going to necessarily pull up most of these charts to look at. It's uh, they're there for us to see and to use if we want to. However, at work, like as an example, and in most airlines, they just have, honestly, the majority of the weather, believe it or not, that you guys will look at and use is really going to be the textual weather, like the stuff you're reading, the METARs, the TAFs. You're really going to look at that and rely on that probably more than you really do looking at this graphical stuff. You so would think that, more detailed. yeah, it's more detailed, but the thing is it's more specific to your location, to your origin, to your destination, <coughs> or alternate airports that you pick. So out of all the weather stuff that you guys see and look at, I mean, it's important to be able to look at and see radar and understand what it is and where it's moving and things like that. But like, say like a chart like this, I don't think that I probably look at charts like this, except for in here, you know, except for fulfilling the FAA requirement of showing you guys this chart. For the most part, all of this stuff, now not, not to say that it's not handy, it's not useful, but like when we're at work, all of this stuff, everything you see here, pretty much every one of these charts that we're going to quickly look at, most of this stuff is all overlaid on our screens at work. So even when we do, and I know those of you guys that have sat in, so who's all sat in? Just just you two, right? Are you? Oh, that's right. You did go the one night. Okay. Did you go? I know, yeah, I know you've seen it, obviously. Do you, like you haven't seen it? I haven't seen it. I mean, I've, I've looked at all this stuff. I've done I've done all this stuff, but I can't play it. Yeah. Well, Scott, Scott did the one night. Anyway, you saw the big map thing that we have, right? It's called yeah. Fusion. That's the name of that program. That's actually the name of this program that we're looking at here, too. But uh, 
Fusion shows us where all of our planes are. It also shows us all the weather. It basically takes all of this stuff, and it's a lot better looking than all of this stuff as well. But it, it'll show all of our frontal boundaries. It'll show your high and low pressure systems. It'll show your radar. It'll show even these white, you know, like the satellite imaged clouds, if you have it turned on. Most people don't even turn that on. Most people just turn on radar. They're just not, not even the satellite stuff, but just simply the green... Yeah, the precipitation, the actual Doppler radar imaging. They'll turn that on because that will show you your – you don't really care about clouds. Like mostly like there's only certain times you'll ever really care about clouds. And, you know, you might turn that off and on based on if you want to see if you can see like a fog bank rolling in or if you want to – if you're planning a flight that – can't fly into certain like icing conditions or stuff like that stuff that we'll talk about at great detail later on but generally speaking you don't really care about just regular clouds the only types of clouds you care about is stuff that's got rain or convective activity and convective um convective specifically means thunderstorm type stuff so um, <clears throat> that's all you really are looking for. Um, so most of it we don't turn on. Now a frontal boundary, like like on my Fusion, my program there at work, I have frontal boundaries and things like that because I like to be able to see, you know, where a cold front or a warm front is at because I know that those are normally like weather is normally along frontal boundaries. Okay, especially convective thunderstorm type weather is mostly found along those boundaries like you can see like this line here i mean it, it pretty much follows the cold front or is out in front of the cold front you know pushing down you know towards the gulf here this over here so all of this stuff is more of just due to the local air mass conditions of that area so it you know, not that you really have to follow or to kind of know necessarily what that is right now, but but the big thing about like frontal boundaries is just knowing you know that weather generally occurs along frontal boundaries. That's that's pretty much it. So this is a surface to pick or a surface analysis chart is what this is. It's just telling us what's going on right now across the U.S. If we were to look around, there's a high pressure here, there's a low pressure here, there's a cold front from here all the way to here. There's an occluded front up in this area, you know, a trough over here. But other than just knowing that that's what's there, that's that's about as much help as it really is. So the next one is called a weather depiction chart. It's kind of the same thing. Only difference is that this is kind of mapped out a little bit differently. So if you see this legend down here in the left-hand corner, it says blue stands for marginal VFR and red stands for IFR conditions, okay? So has everyone heard the term VFR and IFR before? So VFR stands for visual flight rules. And IFR stands for instrument flight rules. So the difference between those is, so VFR really means that it's a non-weather, like there's really no weather going on. I mean, not it's, it's, a, it's a good weather condition or a good weather day or whatever. If I were to say uh, today here in St. George, it's totally VFR. That just means that there's no adverse weather going on here in St. George. There's no ceilings. There's no low visibility. There's no precipitation. That's really ultimately what it means. It means, definition-wise, it means conditions of better than three miles visibility and cloud, like from the standpoint that we look at it, clouds, like, a, like there's no cloud ceilings of less than 2,000 feet. Um, when we talk about marginal VFR, that basically means that it's kind of, it's not great weather, obviously, but it's not horrible weather. It's basically 
visibility between one and three miles and ceilings between 1,000 and 2,000 feet. Now, is anyone, when I talk about a cloud ceiling, does everyone or anyone know kind of what that is or cloud ceiling? Well, yeah, it's really just the the base the base of the cloud. So now, but in this case though, a ceiling means a little bit something a little bit different. So so write this down, okay? <clears throat> and Garrett just chimed in over here on the messenger says lowest layer of broken or overcast clouds. It is the bottom. However, it is only ceiling. A ceiling is only related to when you see broken or overcast. So when you see the thing that says few, 3,000 feet, or scattered, 3,000 feet, those are not ceilings. It's not considered a ceiling. But if it says broken or overcast, that is considered a ceiling. So broken means that basically 75% coverage of the sky of, with clouds. And overcast obviously means 100% coverage. So you get down to few, that's like 25%. Scattered is more like 50%. So just, and that, those are just, just throwing those out there. But Scattered and few are not considered ceilings. Broken and overcast are considered ceilings. So when I, if I say to you, tell me what the ceiling is in Salt Lake City right now, and we were to look up the METAR, and we would look at the, the sky conditions, and you know, and you've seen it already, but sometimes it'll say multiple different clouds, like few, 4,000, scattered, 5,000, broken, 10,000. So it's really until you see one that says broken or overcast, that's the first one that's going to be the ceiling. So if it says, if it doesn't say, if none of them say broken or overcast, then there is no ceiling. Okay. So you're looking for the, the lowest one that says broken or overcast. That's your ceiling. Now it might say broken 10,000, overcast 15,000. It's whichever one of those two is lower. It's the lowest one of those two. Or if it even says the same thing, broken 10,000, broken 20,000, same thing, just the lowest one. So what's what's the limit you said? Or? Yeah, like what's the, like when does it start to become considered a ceiling? Like well, the height? lowest ceiling you could have, you could have a ceiling all the way down at 100 feet. Or like feet. the highest, I guess, is what I'm asking. Um, like you got tons of like clouds, but they're way up. Is that still considered yeah, ceiling? Yeah, I mean, if you had, now it, it would be uncommon to have a ceiling way high, but I mean, you can have a ceiling. I mean, we've, we even read some that were 25,000. So I'm pretty sure you can get them up to 30,000, you know, maybe even higher. But generally, once you get up at that high, first of all, you got to understand all weather only occurs in the troposphere. Okay. So wherever the top of the troposphere is, which it, it varies depending on the temperature of the areas, but the troposphere really only goes up to yeah I mean and, and, but that just depends though too so if, like on a really hot day like here in St. George the troposphere could reach all the way up to 45 50,000 feet but you know normally speaking yeah 40 45 maybe lower so anyway weather all weather occurs in the troposphere so really you're not going to ever see clouds you can see them break into the you know, above the troposphere, but that'd just be on a really hot day. But the only reason I'm kind of mentioning that is just, you know, ceilings really don't, you don't see them way, way high, basically. So, but for you guys, the ceiling is the lowest layer of broken or overcast clouds. Um, so this chart is telling us 
that so the red areas are considered IFR and then the blue areas are considered marginal VFR. So like up here in central Oregon, we see some area of IFR. Then along the coast over here, you see marginal VFR around it. You see marginal VFR here, you know, Salt Lake area, Front Range area in Colorado here in this area that we already looked at in Texas around Lubbock. You see some IFR in some areas as well, a little red. Over here, the Nova Scotia area. Anyway, um, that's all that that's telling us. This CIGS just stands for ceilings. It just means that this area has ceilings. Like that's the type of marginal VFR or IFR weather that's occurring in that area. The other, like the lines and the dots, are basically precipitation. Um, if we want to know specifically. There's a little chart that actually has all of those on it, but it's not necessarily something you need to know or memorize, but anybody that wants to see it, I can show it to you later. But um, that's what all of these things are basically telling us. It's like you can look at this, and, and once again, this is not something that dispatchers normally use. Most of your weather that you're looking at, you're going to get from your TAFs and your METARs. So, you know, you're, I've never looked at one of these charts to see – if my destination of my flight is going to be in marginal VFR or IFR conditions. So, but just so you guys know what it is, that's, that's all that this is kind of showing us. Watches. This is more for thunderstorm warnings and things like that. Let's wait for it to load up here. So these are current watches that are going on. And zoom in over there, but these are basically just, um, let's see, thunderstorm. I didn't want to zoom in on that. Go back out. Yeah, so just National Weather Service will issue watch areas, and those are the only two that are really going on right now. So um, so this up here, if you can see this yellow line, that's basically saying these are severe thunderstorm watches. The only two watches they issue are severe thunderstorm and tornado. So they're saying severe thunderstorm watches for this New England area up there. Oops. It's just that other room because it heats up, it makes this one go down. TCF. Logan is the test drive. You should go up there. Really? I hated that. I made it one winter and I moved down. Okay, see this this right here? This is probably one of the most useful charts that you'll use as a dispatcher. This is called the TCF chart. So what that stands for is Thunderstorm Collaborative Forecast. So what it means, though, is, so see these areas right here? So the only really areas that it's even showing right now is showing this little circular area down here in southern New Mexico and then it has it's outlined in red and it's kind of got these little dots or lines in it and then down here this has this thing that says 390 pointing to it and then of course there's this other one right here from West Texas all the way into almost to Little Rock Arkansas these are areas of forecasted thunderstorm activity or where it's predicted that there will be thunderstorms over the next four hours. So this is a four hour forecast. So over the next four hours, if you have a plane flying through this area, 
you may want to route it around this. So this is actually helpful for us. This is something that we do look at a lot, this particular chart. And what are the numbers? So those numbers, like that 340, that means that is the expected top of the clouds, 34,000 feet. The other one in New Mexico is 39,000 feet. So if you were to fly, like if you were routing a plane through that area, you would know that the expected, the expected top of those clouds is 34,000. So if your plane is capable of flying higher than that, you may be able to just actually fly over it instead of needing to fly around it. This one that's 39,000, you would not be able to fly. Like at least in the jets that we fly at SkyWest, you would not be able to fly over that. The highest we fly is 39,000. So um, you couldn't fly over it. So that one you would want to route around it if you had, let's say you had a Houston to Tucson flight. You know, it's going to come right along this corridor it's going to the most optimal route is going to be right through this because you can't go into mexico without a permit so it's going to want to stay north of the border and that then you know you're getting to this point here um you know if it's a, if it's pretty severe then you're going to want to route up and around it and then back down to tucson are those little diagonal lines the direction it's that just means that's like the severity of the area. So the, the more shaded in it is, the more probable of the thunderstorms occurring. That's that's all it is. Sometimes you'll see this entire thing just completely filled in with red. That means it's pretty much 100% chance that it's going to be there. So, but more like this, this is more like 50-50. So the last chart showed that we had a watch up in New England. And that doesn't show anything. Yeah, for these, it doesn't show anything. Yeah, it's kind of weird. But you're never really looking at the watches chart anyway. You're really looking at – this is actually – is probably single-handedly the, the most useful chart you'll probably look at on a continual flight-by-flight -flight basis. This one's overlaid on – like on our Fusion as well, on our network. So TCF. When you're rerouting things – do you have to take into account, like, I mean, what time it's supposed to land at the other airport? Because you have, like, a gate and everything and connections and all that stuff. Like, do we have to? Yes and no. I mean, not, like, normally that's not really a dispatcher's concern, like, too much. I mean, you'll you'll get, you know, people not calling you so much, but they'll call, like, the regional controller. And they'll ask about, hey, why is this flight so delayed or whatever? And, no, oh, well, it's because the dispatcher had to route it 200 miles around a thunderstorm, a line of thunderstorms. And so we put it an How hour behind. How much time would that add on to a flight? Uh, just depending. I mean, it, it could add on 30, 40 minutes, okay. you know, depending on how far the detour is. But generally not not too much. I mean, if you, had, if you, were, if you were sending a flight, let's say you're sending a flight from – Denver to Dallas Fort Worth. Okay. I mean, it's not like you're not going to necessarily like file it like down and like around and then up, you know, or, or this way and around. Like, you're not going to like go crazy out of the way like that, especially when you'd have to backtrack. But if uh, like for this, something like this, I mean, you could expect the movement to kind of just like keep. You know, eventually you would probably expect this just to be over Dallas Fort Worth. So, a lot of occasions when you're doing flight planning, sometimes you just actually file it as if it's going to fly right through it, but you just add on extra fuel in case they need to sit back and hold, you know, and wait for it to go through, or in case they do end up having to route around it. So, a lot of times you don't know necessarily what's going to happen. So, do they make that call for pilots and stuff, or is that you? It's kind of a. It's really kind of a – yeah, it, it's a joint effort between you, the pilot, and the ATC. So are we following through on the flight from, like, takeoff to landing with the weather and everything? We're mm -hmm. just, like, watching it, basically. Yeah. Yeah, you're watching it. So if this thing took off from Denver, you know, they're probably going to get up. They're going to get up into the air, up to cruising altitude, and they're probably going to start looking, okay, well, what does Dallas look like? You know, and then they'll probably message you, how does the radar look? You know, do we need to – we're going to need a route around it. We're going to be able to go through it. You know, what's ATC doing? Are they taking people through it? You know, 
they're going to start asking you a bunch of questions and you're going to just, you can look, I mean, everything's right at your fingertips. So you can pull up all the flights. You can see what other flights are doing. You can see if ATC is routing them through, like if there's a gap that opens up in the storm, the ATC will just route planes right through it, you know? So it really just depends on, there's so many variables that it's just hard to say sometimes like exactly what's going to happen. So sometimes the best thing to do is just put on a lot of fuel and be able to do any of the above. That's kind of sometimes the best approach. If you know, like if you were going Denver to Houston even maybe, then you would probably want to actually just route it around it. Now, generally speaking, weather in the U.S. moves from the west to the east. So this storm, you could expect it to just move east. That's what pretty much all weather does. So it should be moving this direction. So if you filed it to go around the corner down here, you know, by the time it actually gets down here, you know, it's it's actually this is just going to be even further east. So it, it's harder to like route stuff around this way because as you go this way, the storm's actually moving that way. So it's going to push you even more. So it's usually best to go around the back than it is around the front or the top. If that makes sense. So, but all of that will really kind of come more into perspective later when you train and look at this a lot more. But this is a very useful chart. That's kind of ultimately what I'm getting at, the TCF chart. So just remember that one. Low-level significant weather prognosis chart is the next one. So this is kind of like that weather depiction chart that we looked at two charts ago that shows the marginal VFR and the IFR areas along with your frontal boundaries, your high and low pressure areas. The only difference with this one, though, is this is 12 hours from now, and this is low level. So this is considered the surface um, from the surface to about 10,000 feet, 5,000, 10,000 feet. This is considered what they think is going to occur 12 hours from now. So you can go out and change this. You want to go 24 hours. You can look at 24, and it'll change everything for you, what things are supposed to look like 24 hours from now. You can see things kind of shifted. You can see there should be marginal VFR and IFR conditions along like this, the coast of California from San Fran all the way down to San Diego going into even northern Mexico down there. But anyway, that's all that this is. It's just in the future. The next one is the surface weather. Kind of the same idea, except this is actually showing you the radar, the Doppler, and the satellite imagery again. But once again, this is... 12 hours from now, and this is just strictly for the surface. You can go 24 out, 36, 48, 72, 96, all the way out to 120. Gets pretty unreliable out here, 72 hours plus, though. Most weather forecasting is once you get two, three, four days out, pretty pretty inaccurate, basically. Show Even a hurricane. About 12 hours. If we go 24 hours out, let's see what it shows. Now, this doesn't show like those mod, those the shaded. It doesn't do the blue and the red on this chart. It's actually showing you the clouds. So this is like if this is fog that they're expecting down here along the coast, it's not going to show up on this. This is just telling you precipitation-wise what it's looking like. Now, if you go out 36, there, at, at one point it actually does change to a different looking thing if you go out far enough. So you kind of see now we've got more green in this area. Once you get, I think, 48 maybe. How accurate is that 48 out? Like you're saying, that's got to be a little bit It's It really is, yeah. It's, I mean, it's pointless to even look at pretty much. The only time I ever look at this, and this is ever, ever look at this. I never look at it at work, put it that way. Secondly, the only time I ever look at it 
is if I'm going to travel. That's really the only time I look at this. So if I'm traveling back to like my in-laws back here in the Midwest, Missouri, Arkansas area, sometimes I'll look at this just to see like, and the only reason I'm even doing it is because I know that bad weather disrupts flights. Like, you know, and so from a standby basis, if I'm looking like, okay, I'm going to take this flight in four days and try to fly out to go see family. Like, I kind of want to see what they think it's going to look like on that day, four days from now. That's the day I'm supposed to fly. And so I'll start looking at it four or five days out on this chart to kind of see because, you know, bad weather is going to make flights cancel. It'll make people, you know, reschedule, misconnect on flights, miss their connections in hubs. And so those end up taking up seats for standbys. So that's honestly the only thing I use this for. So. Anyway, let's go to the winds aloft. So this is the winds aloft, and this this is this is a, a chart that you can change. So we're looking at 45,000 feet here, but I can change this: 45,000, 39,000, 34,000, 30,000, 18,000, 10,000, all the way down to 5,000 feet. This. Uh, you can see the jet stream if you've got a good eye in here, but sometimes it's kind of hard to tell. Yeah, mostly it is. Um, now, when you look at this, these little barbs, as they call them, not to be confused with barb. <laughs> is it getting <laughs> These are all wind barbs. And each of these lines, so if, let's say if we look at, if we look at like this, like let's look over Nebraska right here, like this one that I'm circling, each of these lines is 10 knots. So you, this is telling us the wind speed. And this is, remember, this is 45,000 feet. So 10, 20, 30, 40, and then a half one is five. So the wind speed right here is 45 knots. And then it's the wind is blowing the direction that this is pointing. So this end right here is the direction that it is blowing. So this is blowing south southeast at 45 knots. When you look at these ones over here, like this one, just these little filled in triangles, that just means 50. So that's just straight up 50 right there. This right here is 55. This one right here is 60. So you kind of see this is kind of your stronger, so your jet stream, if you're trying to find that, follow the triangles mostly. Your jet stream is coming down right through here, turning and going up right here. You can kind of see if you follow that, those higher speeds, that's going to be your jet stream. As you see clear up here, it's pretty, you know, 20 knots. This is 15 right there. That's only five. Down here in Texas, it's totally blowing the other way. So another thing here is you can also see, um, especially as we go lower, but down here you can see, you can start to see the rotation. If you kind of see this is blowing this way, it starts to turn this way, then it blows this way, and then up, and then over. You can see that there's a low pressure down here because you can just follow those wind barbs and you can see that it's a counterclockwise motion down there. As you move this down, let's, let's just jump straight down to 30,000. Now the higher the altitude, generally speaking, the faster the wind. In the winter, it's even more so. So let's look at those same areas over Nebraska. Now it's 25 knots. So this is 30,000 feet now, so 15,000 feet lower. 25 knots, generally blowing the same direction. This one is 35. You still got 50 over here, though, 50, 60. So you can still kind of see, get over Texas down here. It's kind of light wind blowing to the south, straight south, but you can still see the, that same rotation going on. Let's move down to 10,000 feet. Yeah, I mean, the only way they can measure it is via the balloons and 
pyreps. So this is 10,000 feet. You can tell the wind is a lot less. And it's also now more, it doesn't hold its direction as well. Like at 45,000 feet, the wind is pretty steady. It's always, this is all due to terrain and then the Coriolis effect. The closer you get to the earth with wind, the more it's going to die down, the more it's going to change shape and not follow the same directional patterns. The other thing I failed to mention is these little things, these like 11, 12, those are, that's the temperature. So back when we were at 45,000 feet, you, see, you were seeing like negative 50, negative 60. That's negative 60 degrees Celsius. So 10,000 feet, we've got 11 degrees Celsius here, 6 degrees, 4 degrees, 1 degree, 0 degrees over here. So that's your temperature in Celsius. So that's our winds aloft. Um, severe weather outlook. I'm not even going to show you that because severe weather outlook and thunderstorm probability are really kind of trumped by that TCF chart that we already looked at. High level significant weather prognostic chart. That's just kind of looking at those ones that show 12 hours, 24 hours, but high, high level. So like 18,000 feet and above basically. <clears throat> but same thing. We don't use them for much. Observed winds. That's kind of like what we're looking at. One that I do look at, though, sometimes, is this freezing levels. So let's look at that one real quick. So this is telling us the altitude of the freezing level. So like right here is an example over Salt Lake City. The freezing level is at, so this is going back to kind of the same way we were looking at, like the in the cloud levels. So 14, four, so 14,400 feet. That's your freezing. That's that's the point that the, the air temperature reaches zero degrees Celsius. Anything above 14,400 feet will be negative temperatures or freezing. So the, the thing that this is helpful for is if you're um, is if you're doing a flight plan, and a lot of times with our flight planning we have restrictions. Like um, if something on the aircraft, like let's say the anti ice system for the wings is is in op, um, and we don't have that capability to to melt ice on the wings, then that's going to restrict us from being able to fly into conditions where it might ice up. And the ingredient for icing is anything less than first of all the first ingredient in order to form ice is going to be moisture so you got to have moisture so any visible moisture and when i say visible moisture it's it's anything even a cloud is considered visible moisture okay so you can't even fly through a cloud if the temperature is less than is in the freezing category right so we actually have a buffer zone though like for dispatching airplanes our icing conditions are considered, and you'll want to write this down, icing conditions are, number one, visible moisture present with a temperature of 10 degrees Celsius or less. So anything 10 degrees Celsius or less with visible moisture is considered icing. Now, sometimes we can fly, you know, we can go up to 39,000 feet with a no icing restriction as long as we don't fly through visible moisture. We have to avoid rain. That means they can't fly through any clouds. Anything like that is going to be the restriction. So this chart helps with that kind of stuff. 10 degrees or less. Anything 10 or under. So really 10 degrees Celsius is your, it's kind of your bingo temperature. That, from that point, anything that or less is going to be the temperature. And then the only other factor in there is going to be moisture. One of the things about icing that's interesting is that they're talking about 
the water in the clouds is still in droplet form, and that the friction keeps it from freezing even though it's cooler now. Yep. Yeah, and then when it hits the plane, that's when it freezes. Yep. That's a trick. Yeah, those are called supercooled. Super yeah, supercooled water droplets. But yeah, that's, and they also call that freezing rain too. So we don't get a lot of that here because of like the dew point. Like here in the air and environment, like the desert, if you notice, if you pull up the METARs here, our temperature and our dew point normally in this type of an environment, it doesn't matter if it's the middle of winter or the middle of summer, our temperature dew point spread are usually really high in this in a desert environment. And if you look at somewhere like if you look anywhere humid, the temperature and the dew point are always closer. Right. And so. It kind of when it when you're looking at like like, for instance, this is a really kind of a, you know, is a good example. Like my my father in law, anytime he comes out here like during the winter not necessarily even here but when we lived up north we'd be driving around out in the snow and stuff and he would always be so concerned with the temperature and we'd be like we'd be driving up in the mountains and it would start to snow and you see the snow and he would just start like his eyes would just become fixated on the temperature gauge in, in the car or the you know when we we're driving around and the reason being is because he thinks in his head as soon as that thing hits 32 degrees Fahrenheit, we're in freezing conditions, and the road's going to ice up. That's what he thinks. Because out there, we're in Arkansas, Missouri, it does, you know, because of the humidity factor, the the dew point, the temperature. Like out here, you know, in the like, you know, like I know we don't get a lot of snow here, but going up north, Salt Lake, the roads don't ice up. The road, the 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 ground doesn't even. The snow doesn't even stick to the road until you get down to like 20 degrees. So a lot of people try to figure out like, well, why is that? You know, like, why is it, why don't we get, why doesn't it freeze at 32? Isn't like 32 supposed to be freezing, you know? But the, the difference is, is that the air, like the difference between that temperature and the dew point spread is going to be like the deciding factor as to when like snow and things like that actually like adhere to roads and like ice is created or right, the, the road will get icy out in a humid environment where the air is more saturated with water. When, you know, snow starts to fall, they, the roads immediately ice up because the dew point is literally usually within a few degrees of what the actual temperature is. So that means you always have lower lying clouds. That means you always have fog. Conditions like that always are going to be more prevalent in areas that, that that's more humid. Even if you look at like the coast of California as a great example, like when you like look at stuff like regarding fog and dew point and temperature spreads. I, now, California is not humid necessarily, but California does have like anytime you're along the coast, you have you have the ocean which. You know, we all know that water doesn't heat up and cool as quickly as land does, right? So in order to heat up the ocean, it takes a long, long time. Kind of like when we were talking last week how, you know, the uneven heating of the, the earth, like as the sun comes north during the spring months, like we don't get that bad adverse weather like we get in August because the water takes a long time to heat up. You know, as we go north, the land doesn't necessarily take that long. But on any given day, though, just even in a 24 hour cycle, you know, the earth will heat up to where it's hotter than the water. And then at night, as soon as the sun goes down, the land starts to cool, but the water retains its temperature because it can't heat up and cool as fast. And so as soon as that's why that's why when you, you when you're at out, out of yeah, I can't even talk when we get this far into glass, um, the water. If you're out, you know, and you get like the ocean breeze and you get the like the marine layer of clouds, it always transverses itself at night. So at night you get you usually will get a, a land breeze where the wind blows out to sea. And then when the sun comes up and starts to heat up the land, the, the wind will flip and you'll get a sea breeze all day long because whatever is warmer, if the if the water is warmer than the land, the air is going to be sucked out to the ocean. If the land is warmer than the sea, 
the waters, the wind is going to be sucked inland. So that's why you'll get that wind shift. And that's also like while you'll get right when the sun goes down, you'll get like fog banks that roll over. You'll get, you know, as well as in the morning, you'll get fog that gets created inland and then it'll move. You know, it just kind of goes back and forth. But if you ever get into weather that much, you know, like where you're wondering why like little things happen like that, I, all of it is really just related to just the heating, you know, the difference between the water temperature and the land temperature, especially along the coast. So any questions on anything? right to the bell today so cool well we'll uh, end it there for today then um and yeah we'll see stuff sent back out tomorrow i'll throw on a uh a thing to so you guys can finish up with barb and, uh, watch some of those charts but cool that's it Thank you, Sarah.